Okay, so I am going to talk on the poorly known cyprinids of the Indian subcontinent today. So my presentation will go in this flow. Like first I'll try to explain what I mean by poorly known and how taxonomy has evolved in the past. Uh, and many species that are poorly known were known in the hobby or local people had already known them for quite a long time. And only that it, they didn't have a proper name. Proper name meaning they didn't have a binomial name. They would have had a name in the local tongue, something like a, what are the local people call it? Like putli or some punti or something, something they'll call it. But they, didn't, they were not officially described and not known to science. And that is where taxonomy comes. We classify it and we give it a proper name. And the name is like far across the world. There are no different names, separate names. And I'll be talking about five groups because I've been given Cyprinidae, day and that is my field of interest also. I'll be talking about five groups, the Gilius group, the Orichthys group, the Labuka and Chela group, and Opsarius. And I, we, we, we are used to calling it Berlius, but in recent day, Berlius has been put under Opsarius. And my favorites are the Dopinsius. So like I said, what is poorly known? So species which are discovered and species which are named and reclassified and classified. So there are species where scientists go on expeditions like how you saw in the last presentation of HH that how they have gone into peat swamps and places which are not accessed by people and they've come up with new species which have never been seen before. Some beautiful colorful species which no man has seen before. But there is another category of fish which we see every day. And like it's been around for 100, 200 years and been around in published literature for at least more than 100 years. But still, we do not know what it exactly is. So this is a very um, tricky situation. We know the fish, but yet we do not know the fish. Okay. And that is basically taxonomy was very rudimentary earlier because anything above a species doesn't exist. Technically doesn't exist in reality. A species is an organism, but genus or family and all those things are for the cataloging convenience. We classify some fish with some characteristics under one genus and the others we put another genus and all of them come under a family and like that we go all fishes are under one, frogs, birds, etc. etc. So if you see for like 30 years back or like 40 years back, barbus was like it was a catch-all for all barbs. Well, barbus, when we say if you see earlier uh, uh, aquarium hobbyist books or some some literature, then you see barbus conconis. Okay. So it is like always been barbus conconis. But if you see now, barbus is a very different use. Barbus, barbus. The barbel is classed as barbus. And now barbus had barbonemus. Barbus had hypsilobarbus. Barbus had capoeta. I don't know. It had like 20, 22 genus were classified under barbus. And barboidus, barbon, I don't know. So many were there under them. And same was for rasbora. When people used to say rasbora, Rasbora again was a catch on. Even the smallest Harlequin Rasbora was a Rasbora. And uh, big, like what we see, Dandias, those are also Rasboras. So basically, the fish were always there. It's only been reclassified. One more is Cyprinus. We now know Cyprinus Scarpio. Okay, Cyprinus Scarpio is a big fish. But if you see earlier literature of Jordan or uh, maybe Day, many of Currently known, Danius were also under Cyprinus. So now coming a little further from 1990s, the first attempts were made to classify them. Like Casey Jaram in his 1991 revision, I think that was a very good attempt he made. Because earlier than that, I think Day and all those people had given some classifications. But Jaram in his first attempt revision of Pontius, 
he tried to bring a lot of species under pantheist. So I don't know, people are like splitters and lumpers, you know, two kind of taxonomists, people who split up species into various genera and people who lump up species under one genera. So I would say that 1991 work was more of a lumper work where he tried to bring more. Some Hypsilobarbus were also under Pantheus. And, but of course, he tried to make at least uh, the genus Pantheus clear. But then 10 years down the line, there was a work by Rohan Pethegoda and uh, Maurice Kotlat, where they first, I think that was the first step for trying to review a group of fish, which were the Pantheus Philemon Persis group. And when they tried doing that, they found out that, you know, Pantheus Mahikola was a very common fish. A lot of aquarium books have Pantheus Mahikola. But the Pantheus Mahikola that we had always known till 2005 was not the real Pantheus Mahikola. Pantheus Mahikola was something which is very different. It's a very drab fish. The problem arose because Day in his drawings kind of darkened the tips of the caudal fin. And because he darkened that, it kind of resembled the filamentosa, which is known like, you know, the, uh, I don't know what is called in, uh, across India, we usually call the filament barbs or in south it's called puali kendai and stuff like that. It has uh, two spots at the tip of the tail. So it kind, kind of got misrepresented and Mahikola was considered to be a fish, colorful fish with a big caudal pinnacle blotch and it had having two tips at the tips of it, sorry, having two spots at the tips of its tail. And further, in 2012, I think that was the major revision, synopsis of South Asian Pontius by Pethigoda et al., where they really classified. They first put a type species for Pontius, they put a type species for Pethia, what was earlier Pontius, Conconius, and all those things have become Pethia. Then there was another, all the melon barbs or the, uh, what we call as Pontius fasciators were brought under Haludaria. And Systomus was brought for the Sarana group. And it was it was a really good. And Hypsilobarbus was kind of given a spe specific mention there, saying that Hypsilobarbus is a separate group. And some of the Pantheus, like Jordani, which was under Pantheus, would rather be a Hypsilobarbus than the Pantheus. So, so if we see, that was the first step that was in revolution of Pontius. Then in 2013, Kotlat did for entire Southeast Asia, where same thing like what we had as Petia companies, there was a tiger bar was on, also on the Barbus, Barbus uh, genus, which he had put on Pant Tigris and all those things were done. So these two revisions, 2012 and 13, kind of really gave a clarity of the genus. So, like I told you, many species in the aquarium trade were already known. I will not tell you the name of this huge fish because I think one of the next speakers will be talking on this. But such a huge fish, people did not know what it was. It was very, very funny to think like that, that such a huge, it's almost as big as the person there. And people did not know what it was called. Maybe it had a name, maybe it did not have a name. But it was quite commonly featured in uh, angling uh, literature. It was quite commonly featured in ichthyological literature. But people, when we see the fish, nobody knew what it was until very recently. But I leave that for my next speaker to elaborate upon. What I'm trying to say is it may not be a small aquarium fish. Even such a huge fish was poorly known. So now you understand, I guess you understand what I mean by poorly known. Poorly known doesn't exactly mean that the fish was unknown. The fish was very much known, but nobody knew what it was, what to call it, what to classify it, whether it's a Hypsilobarbus or a Masi, like Hypsilobarbus are also classified under Masi, Tor and Neolistocarus were also classified under Masi. And so it was a big confusion. So I just taken three species here, and I've been very, what to say, hobby centric, and these species were long, long in the hobby much before they were properly described or named, you'd call them, Chana and Rao, it used to be traded as Chana Blue Blehari. Now that's the problem. So they were trading it as Blue Blehari. Blehari is a species which was similar to it without pelvic fins. So this fish also does not have pelvic fins. It was traded as Blue Blehari until Ralph Brits properly classified it and said that, no, this is something very different from Blehari. And he named it 
Shana and Rao. And the same thing is Nandas and Ruay. This was also traded long as Slaty Nandas, Slaty Nandas, and the trade was long there. People did not know whether it was a new species or whether it was a, a leucistic or a xanthic form of the ordinary mottled uh, leaf fish until it was properly described as Anduai. Then Beta Divario Ramachandranai again is a fish that was in the hobby and it was properly described and it was also like a fang, fang and Pulanda, I think they saw, saw that it was not even fitting into the genus of Divario or Danio and they classified it as a Beta Divario. So all these fish have been uh, put here because I am like saying like, see, Hobby has brought some fish and it has, all these three have been named after people who have been in the hobby. Not scientists or not ichthyologists, but people who have been in the hobby. So now the role of taxonomy is this. Like I told you, we knew the fish, so but it was poorly known until some taxonomist took it up and clarify. I'll give you three very good examples. Ticto. I would, uh, I think you would all agree with me that Ticto is a very common fish in India. Any puddle, any drain, any ditch you go put your net in, you're definitely to find a Ticto or a fish with two spots on the board. It may be Ticto or something like Ticto, but this Ticto is quite common. And the same thing is for Rasbora what we call as Raspora daniconius. They were like Parusiosoma daniconius. Again, this is a very common fish. And every river, every lake, every pond used to have them in abundance. But people did not know what they were. And again, like I told you, Pantius Maikola. These three, till recently, I think 2015, Unmesh et al., they had, uh, I think, designated a neotype for Tikto. And only after that, there was clarity, okay, this is Tikto. And what all the other spotted two spot fish which we currently encounter may not be ticked. And same way was Rasbura dandia. And I think in 2012 or something, it was revised, 2010 or 12 by Patrigora et al. for the fish of, uh, sorry, Rasboras of Sri Lanka, where they said that dandia is the name for the Sri Lankan and the South Indian uh, Rasboras. And Mahikola, exactly, I it was that 2005 paper that entirely changed the purview or, or, or the species which we had known as Maikola to be filamentosa and Maikola to be something very plain silver fish with a spot at the base of the cotton fruit. Other than these, there are three, three groups of fish I'm going to talk about today. So which were also like that, but have been clarified. First is the Petia gilius group. So Petia gilius is like it was described by Hamilton as a like, uh, and he described two species, Petia gilius and Petia canius. The only thing was canius was like he said is a red fish, kind of red fins, and such. It was not a very clear description, but he said similar to gilius. And then subsequently he put this in the synonym of gilius, and nobody after that went into it or found out whether it is real, really a synonym or whether it is a valid species. So, though Hamilton did not uh, reproduce his drawings in the original description, uh, McClelland in 1839 in his work on Indian Cyprinidae, he actually copied Hamilton's original drawings of Gilius and Canius. And when we saw Gilius and Canius, they were obviously two very different fish. So this is the drawing that um, McClelland had put in his plate, plate number 44. It, anybody can say, see this and say, there are obviously two very different looking fish. Gilius is kind of thick set, heavy, broad fish and uh, with a yellow color and the dorsal fin is straight and is canious. Even in McClelland's drawing, we could see that there were quite prominent spines in the dorsal fin and it was a red fish. Much a bit smaller than uh, Gilius. So, like, I, this was the first group that I took up and I wanted to resolve this. So, what we did was go back to the type locality. Like, last presentation, you heard the best are uh, topotypes. Topotypes are uh, specimens that you get from the type locality. So, both Gilius and Canius were from north or northeastern parts of Bengal. And uh, so, fresh collections were made from Bengal area. And when we started collecting, we when the fishes started coming in, 
I could we could clearly see that they were distinct two species. And in addition to these two species, there was one more species which was similar to them, but it was it didn't fit under these two, which I described as Petia aurea. So Petia aurea is really this gilius group. You can say it is distinguished from all other um, uh, groups of Petia by having a very unique uh, color pattern on the body. They have like a color pattern of two or three black blotches on the body, but on preservation it goes. The first is behind the opercle, the second beneath the origin of the dorsal fin to the external mid lateral region, and the third above the origin of the anal fin. And a black spot is also present at the base of the dorsal and anal fin. And the funny part was all these three species were quite common in the trade. They were being traded either as Gilius or Canius or some other name, Red Gilius. What was traded as Gilius? was actually Canius, and what was stated as Canius was actually Gilius, and what was or what we described as Aurea was supposed to be Red Gilius. It was a big confusion. But the funny thing is, all these three species were known quite for quite some time in the hobby. So these are the three species, Petia Aurea, the top one. A and B is uh, Canius, and C is Gilius from North Bengal, and D is uh, Gilius from uh, South Tamil Nadu. If you see this, if you see the pictures, you can clearly see that they are very different fish. The Petia aurea has a very thin caudal peduncle, and Canius has a very prominent dorsal spine with very prominent big serrations. It is a slender fish. Gilius is more a thick set fish with a straight dorsal spine. Sorry. Okay. So. Petia aurea can be clearly distinguished, but it has a larger scale count. It has 25, 26 lateral line scales compared to the Gilius and Canius, which have 21, 22 or 20, 21 scales. And again, it has more lateral transfers of five and a half scales compared to the four and a half of the other two. Nine pedostal scales compared to the eight in Canius and Gilius. Nine circumperuncular was eight in Canius. And uh, aurea can be distinguished by having all fins highline. Highline means like basically they don't have color, it's transparent versus yellow color in Gilius and uh, it is red in Canius. And it lacks the black blotch on the base of the pelvic fin that I'll show you, I think it will be better. So if you can see the um, Canius and Gilius, they have a prominent black spot, it's very prominent. The pelvic fin's base it has, and aurea does not have that. That is a very consistent, very easy to distinguish character. And suppose you have a preserved specimen which have, has lost all its colors or anything, uh, then you can clearly go with its uh, lateral line scales, which is much higher. It's not just one or two scales high, like four or five scales more than all these two species. So then the question comes as other similar species which superficially resemble them. Suppose you have a Gilia or an Aurea and these preserved. Both of them are going to look very much alike because there are there are not going to be much of markings on the body, and you're going to have difficulty. But it is again the Guganio has a complete lateral line with uh, 28 or 29 scales, and Sharmai has much more scale called like 40 scales. That means the scales are smaller. That's what I mean. And uh, Futunia has a prominent black bar behind its gill, which even on preservation stays. So it's, and it has lesser number of scale counts. So I think these are species similar to Gilius group, but which don't fall in the Gilius group. And there was a confusion with Ornata. Some literature, even aquarium literature, started publishing Petia Canius as Aurea, because there was a paper of Baudelaire and Bashia in 2006, which had put a very beautiful picture of uh, Canius. They had put Canius and they had said that this is Ornata. And that in turn got reflected in a lot of uh, aquarium literature. Other literature also, checklists, which started saying that uh, Canius could be Aurea. And this I had a little difficulty until Dr. Vishwanath helped me. And uh, actually, this Ornata is described by Dr. Vishwanath. And then he very nice, he gave me the, very helpful he was. He shared the um, holotype details with me and along with the good photograph, which I've shown here. And then it was very clear that Petia ornata is nowhere close to the Gilius group. 
different fish which may belong to the manipurensis group and not the gilius group so i think the gilius group was finally resolved as having three species oria gilius and canius so these are just some pictures from the net i just put it together so that i can give you a you can get an idea and you can see that they are very different whatever way you look at them in aquarium or something canius has a very prominent dorsal fin shape the spine is always curved and there is a bit of red actually i have some canis in my aquarium right now but they are quite far that i will not be able to show you clearly it is very distinguished feature of canis the dorsal spine is always curved and for gilius again it is always straight it is never curved so just to all the top row is here is canis you can see the red dorsal fin and the curved dorsal fin spine and the row below is um, gilius so the next group that i would be touching upon is the orectes again orectes was considered monotypic that means there's just one species which is coswatis and coswatis was thought to be across southeast asia from india to southeast asia coswatis said that everywhere there was a parvus which uh, was synonymized under coswatis and any orectes caught from either india western ghats to southeast asia anywhere burma or anywhere was labeled as coswatis there was no clarity until shafer in 2009 he described crenacoides crenacoides is a very beautiful aquarium fish again crenacoides was quite common in the trade before it was described people again knew it was, it was something new it was an orectes but it was not coswatis but nobody knew what it was after being in the aquarium trade for quite a long time it was described as orectes crenacoides from jorai and in the same paper he re resurrected or he redescribed Predated Orectes parvus and said that no, this is not a synonym of Coswatis. It is it is a valid species. In the same group, a shafer mentioned that from the aquarium trade, from an aquarium dealer, he had um, got an, a specimen of Orectes, purportedly from Assam, with a complete lateral line and higher lateral line scale. We had also published a photograph. Uh, of a very different looking a long fish with a lot of scales in the lateral line series and the main thing that complete lateral line usually orectes have incomplete lateral lines so again by because it is an aquarium fish we have a lot of aquarium traders helping us out and like after a long search we got these specimens from uh, guyan ghat dibru river in sukhi assam from assam we got this and once i was pretty sure it is from that locality it was a very distinguished fish very different having a complete lateral and very small scales so we i described it as orectes andro andro uh, in honor of andro rao who had got me the fish and it can be clearly distinguished from all its congeners by a complete lateral line 30 scales you can see the all the congeners be it crenacoides or coswatis they had like 20 scales max that's it 20 21 but this one had 30 31 scales so it's a marker like 10 scales more quite clearly distinguished from the other species so you can see all the three species of north indian orectes the top one is uh, androi you can see the small scales and even in the picture you can see that it has a complete lateral line running till the last scale in its row this is coswatis incomplete lateral line much larger scales and this is crenacoides crenacoides is a beautiful very beautiful fish i have these also in my tanks they were they were, they were spawned this year and uh, just to i'm sorry my my phones was all ringing and i had spread out and so crenacoides you can see it's got a much uh, rounder heavier face compared to the other two species and male crenacoides get a beautiful dorsal fin 
it, this is very very poor representation. They they have huge. It almost comes up the um, cardinal fin, a huge like a flag. It has a beautiful fin, and clearly distinguished from the other species. Where it has like 20, 20 lateral line scales. This is the orectes from the north of India, and the species which is found in the Burma side is orectes parvus. So. Again, Orectes are not restricted to the Gangetic um, plains. Long there have been records of Orectes on Western Guards. Again, Jeram had described Kurgansis, so Pantheus Kurgansis. He had classified this under Pantheus, but um, Petyagoda in their work of Pantheus had hinted that this could be a Orectes. It, could, it, it would uh, better fit into the genus Orectes than so again, uh, me and uh, Dr. Rahul, we had a check of all the species of Western Guards. They collected a lot of specimens. And we found that uh, Pantheus purgensis was a valid species. And again, Pantheus purgensis was earlier synonymized under um, Cosuatis, but we found out that like uh, how Tigoro et al. had hinted it could be a valid species. It was a valid species. And in the time, we also found that the Diospilus and Incognito were two new species that we encountered. So, Kurgansis can be uh, distinguished from its congenus by these characters like 22 to 23 scales and 5 to 8 port scales, 3 and a half, 2 and a half transverse, and 6 to 7 predorsal scales. And it has a faint black spot on the caudal base, caudal fin base. And the other two, Diospilus and Incognito, like um, it also, Diospilus has almost a complete lateral line because all, it, of the 23 scales, the lateral line uh, port scales sometimes reach up to the 20th scale, 20 or 21 scales. And it has two black spots, one on the dorsal fin and other on the inner fin. Incognito is again a very it was hidden. That's why we, it was a hidden species, like something like a, the name incognito says hidden. So it was like always there, but not there. We never knew it. And the main character was that it has very few transfer scales, large scales, big scales on the body, like one and a half scale from the line to the pelvic. So these are the photographs of those species. If you see, this is um, Kurgansis. And this is Diospilus. You can see the two spots clearly there and lateral line almost coming through here. And this is um, incognito. Very clear incognito. Of course, in the live photograph, I, it is not very clear, but there's a beautiful black bar, black strip here. You can see that's why I put a, this uh, um, of the dorsal fin of a preserved specimen. So this is how the, it has a nice bar on that, on the dorsal fin. And like I said, it has only one and a half scales. So it's like, you can see these scales are very big. So one and a half scales, it has the transfers. All the others have one and a half or three scales. And I, this is not a, this is not an orictis. This is from the Google, a Google image of Quantus vitatus. Funny part is when we were just flipping through a lot of literature and just finding out, incognito is always known. There, are, there have been many pictures of incognito labeled as Pantheus vitatus. So if you see, these two are very close in this caudal peduncle spot. Both of them have, both of them have these uh, bar on the dorsal fin and quite large scales, big eyes, same silvery small fish, and this red uh, dorsal, so this angle of the dorsal fin, and again, red, very similar. And if you see in good, good, good conditions, it will miss, you can, but the only feature which is, Consistent always is this. If you see Pontius vitatus, it has a black uh, spot on the vent. It looks that as if it is halfway in pooping. No, it's always something there. It's the, the spot is always there. It's always clearly visible in uh, preserved specimens. And this is not very incognito. So if at all you collect it on the field, I always like to give a characteristic which would help a person at least bring it to a genus of roughly two or three species, shorten it, uh, sorry, like um, save it down to two or three species. 
So the best character that I have found is that this character. If you find a fish like this with a bar on the dorsal fin, a spot on the caudal uh, hyperal base, and uh, with spot, then it is the common Punteus vitus. If it is not without, if it is not with a spot, and you find it in South Kerala, then it is incognito. So I think I have clarified two groups for you. One is the Petia gilius group, and the other is the um, Oryctes group. So next I would go to the Chela and Lavuka group. So these were also not very clear. And I think, yeah, let me go back. There was a, I have not mentioned it. There was a revision of Lavuka from Sri Lanka. It was done by, I think, Rohan Pategoda in 2012, was not 12, sometime 2008 or 9. And they clarified what is Chela and what is Labuka. So Chela was given, the type species was given as Chela Akbar, and Labuka was uh, Labuka Labuka. And in 2009, we found a specimen of Chela from Chennai. Again, Chennai has been a very what is a well surveyed area? There are so many more than 100 papers on the fishes of Chennai. And like, if the species has always been there and being missed out, it's because it was always classified as Chela catches. So, people who are this, this one front here is Chela macrolepis, and this one behind is Chela atpar. We use the name atpar because uh, I think Gunther gave it uh, preference. So, we consider Chela catches as a synonym of atpar. And Atpar being the senior cinema valid name. So, Chela, this species which we caught from Chennai in 2009 was very different. It had both Labuka characteristics and Chela characteristics. Like, for example, it had a very long filament uh, pelvic fin and it had a um, very sleek, colorless body. And Labukas usually have a humorous spot and a caudal peduncle spot. They did not have that, which is similar to. Chela. So we, the reviewers, we were it was, it was a very long review, and Morris Cotillard was the reviewer, and he was like, "Where do you place this fish?" And we were like, "We don't know." So it's it's got both Labuka characteristics and Chela characteristics, but it is it looks like Chela, but most of its fin counts. And then he said the most predominant characteristics that we have are of Chela, so we place it under Chela. So you can see Chela macrolepis is distinguished very clearly by 35 to 40 scales compared to 60 scales. It has much larger scales than Catches or Akpar. Akpar is a valid name. No. So if you see the scales, these are very minute scales. This one has almost 60 scales it has here, and this one has around 35 scales, half the scales. So there is no doubt that it is a very different species, which has always been there, but nobody knew it. People have been collecting it. People have been recording it. From many, many literatures it has it has uh, appeared, but it has always been named as Chela catches. Okay, so these are then Labuka Labuka from Kaveri. Again, Labuka. Once the Sri Lankan species were cleared, the identity of Labuka Labuka was cleared. Like, what is Labuka Labuka? So once that was cleared, then we realized that. What we are getting from the Kaveri are not Labuka Labuka. And what is again, Kaveri fish were always known. And we found that there were two species which were quite new. Labuka latens was well known in literature. I think Silas in his uh, 1980s had recorded from Kaveri Labuka Labuka. So what Silas had recorded from Kaveri as Labuka Labuka was not Labuka Labuka, but Labuka latens. And then in that search, uh, we found one more species which we named Labuka Trevorai. Again, this is a species named after a hobbyist who is no more, but uh, he was a very ardent hobbyist. And so we thought we should name one after him. So it is very clearly distinct from others by having seven and a half branch dorsal scale, dorsal fin rays, where most of us have eight or eight and a half, eight and a half. Five. And five plus four plus two teeth on the fifth serrated branch. Labuka Trevorai was is distinguished by having two longitudinal stripes, very clear, one gold and one greenish blue stripe on the body from behind the opercle to the base of the caudal fin. And the the other one is the second one is kind of broken, and I show you a picture of that. And Labuka latens was always known 
it was i think silas records is a colorless labuka and yes it was a colorless it has it is drab it has no colors on the body it's just plain white and it has quite long uh, belly fins and just has two spots on the body one behind the fin sorry one behind the gill opercle and the one on the caudal peduncle so these are the labukas all these are live photographs i always like to take live photographs because i have always been a hobbyist and i always keep fish most of the fish i have described you have all here i keep them and i breed them and i really enjoy that part of it more than cutting them and dissecting them and counting their scales so the fish on top is labuka trevorae you can clearly see it that has it has two lines a nice golden line and a dark greenish bluish line it's kind of broken up in the first half but it is a quite clear line and it has short pelvic fins okay the same this is next is labuka latens labuka or latens labuka labuka are very similar that's why silas had uh, put this as uh, labuka labuka only he had just put as a plain drab labuka labuka because it has just same similar humeral spot behind the opercle and it has this caudal hyperal spot also hyperal fan spot and then it has no other markings this has of course some blue spangles on the body but main characteristic which is very clear is the pelvic fins labuka latens has very long pelvic fins and the position of pelvic fin is much further anterior compared to the labuka labuka this is behind and it has very short non filamentous pelvic fins any time you catch these two if you get a fish like this from the cover with long pelvic fins it is clearly labuka latens and if you get the other one with a bit of color on the body and with short pelvic fins it's going to be labuka labuka and this is again a beautiful fish not frequent in hobby but a very beautiful fish labuka fasciata and labuka fasciata just like latens has long filamentous uh, principal ray of the uh, pelvic fin and has a black like rasbora quick thing it is rasbora dandia unless you clearly see that it has long flying like wing like uh, pectorals and uh, a long pelvic so in the group of rasbora dandy this can easily get overlooked as rasbora and daddy bergeray is like you know it is it was before it was called daddy bergeray it was called bergers brilliance in the aquarium hobby so it was always known much much traded fish much sought after fish very beautiful planted tank you can keep them in the planted tanks so it is uh, been classified as neochella daddy bergeray so with this uh, chela and labuka group have been cleared so if you see what like first i told you there are only two species everything was called as labuka labuka or chela labuka and the chela catches sorry so then as we started to look and look and compare with the topo types that is specimens collected from type localities once we could see them it is quite clear that there are so many species hidden that's why even latens means kind of hidden kind of unknown it was always there but it was not known so that is what i would mean as poorly known though we have the fish we know it this is a fish and it has been named something but it actually it is not that we don't know about it so next i'd go to the barrelius group of course it's opsarius but we are all so used to calling them barrelius so again barrelius canadensis was confused when jerdon described them eh, he had put them as opsarius canadensis and opsarius malabaricus he had clearly very clearly he had given uh, two species in his description is very clear but somehow Uh, day when he days fish fishes of india he had done a lot of uh, lumping together and somehow when, when he was lumping together he put the canarensis under gatensis group and this was his drawing so when he drew the fish this was his canarensis drawing but if you would see jordan said there was the species of a double row of green spots on the sides okay fins margin with white so jordan clearly had said that canarensis was a fish with two rows of green spots on the sides and the fins with white and now what they had drawn i don't think anybody would call this as two rows of spots and this fish that he had drawn which had drawn 
doesn't have white fins. I do not know. And of course, he put Malabaricas also under Gatensis. Actually, the picture below is Gatensis. When Jordan was saying spots, I do not know why they put them under a fish. These are not spots. These are clearly bars or what is stripes or whatever you call them. These are not spots. So, somehow, for some reason, just known to him, put these under the Gatensis group. But of course, there was always fish being traded as Burleas canadensis, Burleas canadensis, Burleas canadensis, and all the different types of canadensis we saw, none of them fitted with the base canadensis. So then we thought, okay, we'll make a fresh collection. We will catch all the fish that we know. And because it's a very aquarium uh, sought after fish, we were able to collect from different localities along the southern western guards, and of course, even from north. And then when we saw that there were two fish that exactly fit the description of Jordan. Clearly, when we see, we could see that Jordan's two rows of spots, white fins, one row of spots, orange fin, were clearly there. So based on his description, we also said that, yes, Canadensis does not belong to this fish that we see here. No, the fish that they has described as canadensis is not canadensis. This has huge blotches on the body, while Jordan says as clear to spots. So we found that canadensis and malabaricus were valid species, and what species they had described as canadensis, we found that it was a species unknown to science. Unknown meaning again, it was very well known. People always knew it. It was a much sought after fish, quite quite. Uh, Commonly traded, but it was called. It had always been called canadensis. So, so formally, because it didn't have a name now, we gave it a name called Ardens for the bright, fiery fish color the males get to. So this is a very beautiful fish. It has either seven or eight or sometimes nine huge bars on the body, and these bars sometimes break up into a, another row of spots. Adults get this. Uh, juveniles don't have these very prominent spots, but of course, they also have this very beautiful fish. And it, this can be clearly distinguished from the other two Opsarius, Canarensis, Bakeri, and uh, Malabaricus by having uh, three pharyngeal teeth in the last uh, row compared to the two in the others. If we see Ardens, it has three teeth one, two, three. There's five, four Ardens. All the others have. Five four two or five four two. So Ardens has three very clearly distinguishes very clearly to find out. But of course, in the field, when you want to see a fish, you can't be pulling out its center branch shell and counting it there. So the best way to see is this picture that you see here is very beautiful. It's quite distinct. So, yeah, seven to nine. I think maximum is nine. Usually, it's seven or eight blotches on the body, which break into two rows for adults. And a beautiful fish with orange tipped fins. Then uh, the other yellow fin fish was uh, Canarensis. But of course, Canarensis again can be clearly distinguished from the other Berylias by having a much larger dorsal fin. Even in Jordan's description, you can see there's a he would have written something, there's something different in the dorsal fin. So he was right. This fish, Malabaricus, consistently has one or two more branch trays. It sometimes has 15 branch trays in the dorsal fin. A city and a half, the last one in the same territory before. And uh, uh, like because the anal fin also sorry I'm sorry uh, 15 uh, in the anal fin and 11 in the dorsal fin there's one more consistently one more ray in the dorsal fin and the fin is always margined with orange just as uh, Jordan had described so this is Malabaricus and now this is Canarensis the root cause of all the problem and the confusion so this is the real Canarensis what was not traded with those big blotches, but this fish here would clearly, which perfectly fit Jordan's description. There's nothing contrary. Yeah, this is clearly two rows of spots. Of course, these are clear spots that we can see here. Two rows of spots and fins with all fins. Correct. I say all fins were tipped with white. And there was one variant that we found in, I think, uh, South Canada, which had two rows of spots, but the spots are slightly not rounded, but they're slightly elongated spots. Now, then there was a big confusion like what is Bakeri? Because Bakeri, again, they had described as a fish with white fin tips and slightly elongated spots. 
So when we saw, okay, when we saw that these were bakery, bakery always had a single row. Carriages always had two rows. The spots may be little different, but carriages and bakery are always distinguished by having a single row of spots, there are two rows of spots. And moreover, the wheel rakers of um, bakery are small, fleshy stubs, but carriages have long, spiky, like clear, like comb kind of uh, gill rakers they have. So in, if, you, if you catch them in the field and you want to know what they are, rather than pulling out the gills, you can just clearly see that two rows of spots rounded, they are carences. And if it's gonna be oblong, elongated row of spots, it's gonna be bakery. These are all bakery from different localities along the Western Ghats. Always consistently it had only one row of spots. So the carences consistently had two rows of spots. Whereas the shape of the spots could be slightly different from perfectly round spots to slightly um, what is it, elongated spots. So now we should again go back to day and we should know why he put it under gatensis. This is gatensis, a very different looking fish, which has stripes or like 12 to 15 stripes on the body. And this is barna, which again has stripes, clear stripes, not blotches. Again, there's more than 10. More than 10 stripes, and this is bendelysis. All of them are very small dorsal fins, also. So there's no way you can con confuse them. All these have more than 10 rays. These guys have like seven or eight rays in the dorsal fin. They are small dorsal fins. You can see all of them are like small dorsal fins compared to the huge dorsal fins of these guys. So the Canarensis group can be clearly distinguished by spots, and this huge dorsal fin, even a preserved specimen which you find may not have these beautiful orange or white. You can always see that the fin rays where uh, dorsal fin rays are 10 or like more compared to this which has, sorry, compared to, so compared to these which have uh, eight or something like that. So these are the fishes of, similar to Canadensis group, Gatensis, Barna and Bendlesis. Gatensis is this. So I think now we have done four groups. Uh, let me see, because the last group is my favorite. Yeah, I have some time. I've done it's only for 15 minutes, 10 more minutes, I think I can take. Um, is it okay if I take full 15 minutes, Rajiv, Dr. Rajiv? Yeah, yes, please. Yes, Mark. Go ahead. Okay, so I, I, that's just, I'm on, almost just one more group. So this is my most favorite. I love this group of fish and uh, I have uh, to be proud. I can say that uh, I've kept all of them. All of them I have kept and they're beautiful fish. And I think they are the most beautiful fish in the aquarium trade and aquarium hobby or whatever you call it. But they are the most confused fish also. So I would say people never knew what is, the fish on top was uh, named Mahekola. Long, long time Mahekola. This is Isla. So many people have said Mahekola. And I also, also like Mahekola. We have Mahekola, Mahekola, Mahekola. The first ray of light, came in Petrigoda and Kotla's 2005 uh, review. When they were reviewing it, it was, I think, uh, it would have been very difficult for them because there was so much of conflicting and confusing literature available and people had really made a mess out of this, this beautiful group of fish. People saying that the ones with the, um, what is it, inferior mouth were Mahekola, one with the terminal mouth were filamentosis, and all confusions. But of course, Kotlat and Petrigora didn't have much of Indian material. If they had had, they would have done a lot of more uh, descriptions. But of course, they did a very good thing of basically clarifying the basics. The basic being, Mycola is not what we think it is. Once that was clarified as Mycola was not what it is, then the pieces started falling in place. And basically, it was a very group of, at that time, it was not Dockensia. It was uh, when it, when this thing was, it was still on a Pantius. Later in the review of uh, Pantius by Rohan Petrigoda, he had he had uh, made them into a separate genus called Dockensia because they have this very unique, beautiful character of these males. You can see the male on top with a beautiful filamentous dorsal fin. Beautiful. Sometimes the filaments even go up to the tail, caudal fin. It goes up to the caudal fin and then... So the juveniles have a very beautiful characteristic of having three beautiful bars on the body. And sometimes they get mixed up with uh, ex uh, some melon barbs and they 
get traded as melon bob juniors and the easiest part is that melon bobs have very the bars never go and after a one inch size for these the bars slowly start to fade and the bar on the body and the bar on the caudal peduncle kind of fuses to form this caudal peduncle blotch so this is a very consistent character which is found only in two groups of two genus of fish one is dockensia and the other is sahadri sahadria yeah which is this denisonia and uh, chalacuriensis these two groups have this beautiful characteristic of the juniors having a very different kind of body pattern compared to the adults the beautiful thing i want to say is in that paper they brought out a fish they said a color variety of filamentosa which was described not described which was published by indra in her 1992 paper and they suggested that it could be an undescribed species because it did not have the characteristic black tips of the filamentosa and of course um, i am from kanyakumari district i have i am from that place and when i saw that paper i was like yes i have seen this fish right from my childhood when i used to go go in the ponds when i have gone for uh, fishing when i was a kid when i was like 10 12 i have seen this fish so it was it was like this revisiting my child i went back and i found and it was still there the fish was still there and of course we describe it as dockensia rohani in honor of petty rohan petty goda because i really think a lot of clarity was brought in by him and his team on south indian and sri lankan fishes so he it was dockensia rohani and that was my first species that i described in 2010 so this is dockensia rohani a beautiful fish And if you people can see, it is still running here. There are a lot of them here running. I have good brood stock, and I keep breeding them every year just so that I have a batch with me always. And it has got a very unique uh, combination of characters of this long uh, peduncle blotch. You know, it's almost like some five, six scales long. You have this blotch, and it does not have the clear black tips of the um, caudal fin like you see in the. filamentosa group sorry filamentosa not the group filamentosa and once that was cleared again uh, petegoda et al had clearly distinguished the sri lankan uh, arulias group now what we say about the arulias group is that arulias group always have three big blotches on the body three spots always the uh, there are four species recognized in the arulias group this is uh, sri lankansis tamraparaniyai arulias and rubrotinctus Rubro tinctus again was a synonym. They had put a synonym of uh, Arulias, but of course Jordan had clearly described there are two fishes: one with large blotches and one with small blotches. And the one with small blotches gets more of a red on the body scales, get red, and so I think that's why he had named it uh, Rubro tinctus. Rubro tinctus, rather. So um, these are the two fishes. Sorry, the pictures are not very clear. I just paste it from the PDF and. But you can clearly see they are very different fish. They could have never been synonyms under what sort of circumstances. But again, they, for reasons best known to him, put them as put the <coughs> low. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> My throat is drying out. <coughs> Sorry. Um, the one below Rubro tinctus was put under Arulias. Of course, we found that they are very different species. <coughs> that uh, they have higher number of gill rakers on the first gill arch and of course basically you catch this fish in the wild there's no way you confuse these two like it's quite clear there off oh, i hope i am running off so this is the i think the most beautiful fish that's been like named as apsara like the heavenly fairy or angel or whatever by my friend unmesh and like it is a beautiful fish no doubt and in the Tanks, you see, in the breeding season, the males they get full red and they're very beautiful. And uh, I think in one one place, I first was seen by Dr. Ralph somewhere when he saw what is this? This this doesn't look like the real um, what is it? Asimilis. Asimilis is kind of drab drab fish. It doesn't get so much of red on the body. This fish gets a lot of red. And then we have gone found that it's very uh, different fish. It has consistent red marks on the body and a longer uh, dorsal, uh, sorry, caudal peduncle blotch. And the good thing was, if you see, I just pick back to this one on top is Asimilis. The fish that I have shown here is Asimilis. It has huge filamentous extensions. Huge means really huge extensions. 
And if you see this, that doesn't get that. They get like slight indentations in the dorsal fin and that's it. So it's, uh, we describe this Apsara. And this is Ostellus. This again, I just forgot to tell you that David and the filamentosa group, I would say there are two groups. In the Dawkins, I would say there are two groups. One is the filamentosa group and one is the Aurelius group. Filamentosa group is the ones that have only one spot on the body on the caudal peduncle. And the Aurelius group is what have three spots on the body, or at least two are it. I would put exclamation also in the group. But exclamation, it is an enigma. Let us, I don't have time to go into that, but it, it is the only species that has only one spot on the body. All the filamentosa groups have spots on the body on the caudal peduncle. Sorry, I'm confusing them. Sorry, one, two spots on the caudal tips. And among them, again, we have the assimilus groups. So assimilus group also has the similar character, two spots on the tip of the coral, one spot on the body. But assimilus have um, downward inferior mouth. If you see the mouth of all these, even Apsara, if you see it's an inferior mouth. The mouth is inferior, it's down there below. Okay, but for Rohana, if you see it is, in, for Aurelius and Rohana, if you see if it is, it is in the, it is sub not inferior. Okay, so this is an inferior mouth that you have here. Again, an inferior mouth, and this is a very beautiful character, which is like a checkerboard. After we had named it uh, Astros, I think you should have named it checkerboard, something like a checkerboard. And it's like it's got a very nice checked pattern on the tail. And with this stat, it also is last on preservation. Now, once you preserve it, it's got a nice check, check, check with a light center and a dark uh, scale margins. And so this is Ostellus Lepida. So um, in Rohan Petrigoda's work, they had uh, revalidated Asimilis from the synonym, synonymy of um, Filamentosa based on the inferior mouth and long bubbles. In the same work, they had again hinted that the uh, Asimilis is always in the left flow, sorry, east flowing, so west flowing rivers. They had said that in the east flowing rivers, there is a species which is similar to Asimilis. Tentatively, they put the syntime of Lepida under assimilis, but this is tentative. Nobody, we have not seen the enough specimens to decide. And this again is a very clearly distinct species. It has an inferior mouth. Of course, it falls in the assimilis group. It has long barbels. And it has, the main thing is 17 to 18 pre-anal scales, where others have less than that. Krasa, Dawkins Krasa is a beautiful piece. It's also, this is a very, it's a, uh, what is a dwarf species? It doesn't grow much big. It's it could be it's a very good uh, tank fish. You can keep in a small tank. Small means at least a three foot tank. So it's a beautiful fish with a rounded. We named it Krasa because it's a piece of fat, you know, short body, fat, stumpy fellow, and it, very small tips, very small black spots on the tips of the caudal fin. And it's more of a blotch. It's more oval. If you see the other blotches of all the other filamentosa group, it is like elongated, black, this one is a like round, roundish blotch in the fat fish. And the most easiest part is all other fish in the group have a subterminal or inferior mouth. This guy has got a terminal mouth. If you can see that, it's got right there, terminal mouth. So I think we're coming to the end and yeah. So recently one more was described by Unmesh, quite similar to Kasa, but even more rounded and some scale changes are there. And the spot at the tip of the caudal fin is even more fainter. And I think this guy gets some slight. Why I say is, is the more you look, the more you'll find. So when Petrigoda and Kotlat looked at this group in 2005, they found some, then we found some more and some more and some more and some more, and, some more and it, it keeps going. And Unmesh has found, I think this like two, three months back he found. So the more you look, the more you find. My just parting words would be like, uh, where to look? I would say this is the last slide of mine. You guys should look into Danio, Brachy Danio, Divario group of India. Still, I am not sure like what is Equipinatus, what is Malabaricus, and there are so many synonyms there. Many of them could be valid. In the trade, we get giant Danios, there's big, fat, robust ones, and sleek, slender ones. Then we have these bloodline Danios from northeast and side with red stripes. It's a beautiful group of fish, little known. Again, Salmo Stoma, Salmo Fesia is a complete mystery. I I always 
identify only up to the genus. I say it's Salma fast Salma so that's it. And like nobody knows what is Bakaila or Lupioides or like so many of them. And big species like Bangana labio is still confusing. People can't really put their finger on what species it is. And Gara Silorincus, Para Silorincus, I think all experts would agree that it does need more study. So if anybody is interested, if, uh, all these are known species, but poorly known. So you guys can take it up, anybody interested, and like go dig deep into it and find more. So thank you.